Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our members of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position along with your favorite beverage to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine our show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we wanna say thanks for questions coming from our audience of Smith Weekly, including Paul M, Dave V, Jared W, and Sean M. On the program today is a returning guest, Mr. Stuart McDonald is back on with us. Stuart is the president and CEO of Tesico Mines. The company is focused on producing and developing copper operations underpinned with the existing production at the Gibraltar Copper Molybdenum Mine in British Columbia, Canada, as well as near commercial production stage ISR Copper at its Florence Copper Project in Arizona, United States, as well as a pipeline of other development projects with Yellowhead Copper, the Alley Niobium Project, and New Prosperity Gold Copper. Tosico Mines is listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol TGB on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol TKO and on the London Stock Exchange under the symbol TKO. Stuart, it's a pleasure to have you back on the program. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's great to have you. It's been a while since we've talked and lots of progress at the company. And to start things off, just recently here, the company just released the Q4 2023 earnings. Why don't you start off by walking us through some of those highlights and overall operations update? Sure. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a big year for us, obviously, 2023. We just published our year-end numbers yesterday and uh, did our earnings call a little bit earlier. So it's good news. I think the, and the market obviously liked it. Our stock's up today. Um, no, but 2023 was a great year for the company. Uh, we produced at Gibraltar 123 million pounds of copper, generated an EBITDA for the year of $190 million. That's Canadian dollars. That we call that adjusted EBITDA, adjusted for normal, you know, uh, normalized EBITDA. Yeah, it's, it's great. You know, I think, we're, again, once again, kind of showing the value of, of having a, you know, a stable and proven operation where we can generate good cash flows. It's a strong copper price environment. We averaged uh, 385 was our average realized copper price for the year. Really shows what shows what we can do, uh, shows what the asset can generate. So talk you just a little more detail on what went on during the year. It was definitely um, a tale of two halves, I guess, is the way we're describing it. You know, the first half of 2023 was lower grades, um, slightly lower production. But the second half um, of the year, Q3 and Q4, we got deeper into the Gibraltar pit um, and accessed higher grade ore, higher quality ore, and really um, got our got our production up for the year. So it, it was definitely um, 123 million pounds was definitely weighted towards the back half of the year. You know, but on average for the year, you know, we mined our average head grade of 0.25%, which is right on line with our reserve grade average. It was a very successful year. And not to mention, you know, some of the developments that we had at Florence as well, which we can get into. But uh, obviously the core of our business right now is that Gibraltar operation and that we're happy with the way it's performing. Yes, good updates on that. And to be able to come in where you guys are hitting on head grade and of course reserve grades just speaks to the robustness of this operation and that just how it was set up management team capabilities to be able to yeah. continue to hit pretty well at this project and there's a lot more here as well i think we're seeing as you guys continue to demonstrate that and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment but why don't we back up just a little bit here and let's get a quick take from you on the current state of affairs in the copper market. What are the thoughts on copper market here? And and again, I know this is very subjective and speculative, but how do you see the copper market playing out as we, the economics start to change around the world and we get into 2024 here now and also 2025? You know, when we talk about copper, we're always uh, a little cautious in the short term view <laughs> on the metal because there's so many factors that go into it that are out of our control. You know, macroeconomic factors, uh, Chinese economy, 
you know, it, it, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in copper in the next week or the next month. But uh, I guess a couple comments, you know, maybe just just generally on the on the longer term, you know, what what is clear to us is is the supply demand fundamentals are very strong for producers, right? Like we just the industry continues to have challenges maintaining supply, right? Let alone growing it. So you see the challenges with First Quantum with their mine in Panama being shut down. Um, new mines taking time to taking longer than expected to ramp up. And then older mines, you know, as has happened, you have declining grades. So it's always a challenge on the supply side for the industry. Look around the world. There's some great deposits out there, but they tend to be in risky jurisdictions. It's challenging to, to finance them. And, and, you know, some of the risks that you see, for example, in Panama, are investors and companies give them pause to go into some of these places and make multi-billion dollar investments. So the supply side of the industry is very challenged and as is well documented, you know, the demand side now with, with the energy transition, with the electrification that we have underway, you know, you can argue about how quickly we're going to adopt electric vehicles and things like that, but it's coming, you know, it's coming over the next five, 10, 20 years, continued growth in demand for copper. So the long-term fundamentals are great. We really believe we're in the right commodity. In the shorter term um, outlook, I think a couple of interesting things are happening right now that we see. Um, the main piece that is, is people are talking about is, the, is a sudden and fall in uh, treatment charges, treatment and refining charges out of China. Uh, six months ago, these were, the miners were paying 70 or 80 bucks a ton to, to smelters to process um, their concentrates. In recent weeks, we've seen deals around $10 a ton. And that speaks to, uh, in my view, it speaks to a something going on in, in the end market there where there's an underappreciated a demand happening and, and they underappreciated by the markets, we think. I'm of the view that I think we're going to get a good run here in copper in the next few months. I think we've had a good, established a good floor here for the last year or so around the 375, 380 range. And I, I think it's frankly, I think it's upwards from here. And I think if it's certainly going to go above $4 in the next year and we could spike, we've seen spikes, it could hit $5, you know, but, but I think we're the outlook for, for copper producers is, is very positive. Very good points. I appreciate that. And risk uh, can come in many forms as we've seen, whether it's permitting processes, whether it's places that you thought that were generally low risk have been severely challenged. You, you know, there was a surprise here in Panama with respect to First Quantum and Colorado Panama. And of course, the various push and pull from MGOs and these other groups out there that uh, maybe just yeah. don't understand how copper plays a part in every second of our lives. But besides that point and the educational shortfalls we have across the world. Then you look at places like Alaska, as you know, you're well aware of challenges up there with permitting and what land was set aside to be for versus uh, how people look at it and, and all these different challenges we have on the supply side with very little success on new productive capacity. I mean, I guess the only a little bit of a highlight, I guess, Stuart, as you well know, is uh, what Robert Friedland and Ivanhoe has been able to do in the DRC is a bit of a success story for sure, but we're also seeing closures, depletions, community not accepting projects, uh, all these other problems. And so we're seeing a lot more failures on the yeah. new build front, if you will, than we are successes. And so I agree, it's, it's interesting on that front. And then of course, copper's role in electricity and smarter forms of energy sources like commercial nuclear power makes a lot more sense than maybe some of these other sources. But doesn't matter. At the end of the day, copper plays a role. And so it's yeah. great on that point. So I'm very excited to see the next couple of years play out here as well. Yeah, I think copper, when you compare it to some of the other, or what you might refer to as battery metals, you know, copper has a base of, of demand in the existing uh, economy as it is, right? It's got a hundred years of, you know, where copper demand has essentially grown at between one and 2% a year. And the energy transition is just adding to that, right? It's not, copper doesn't, it's not completely dependent on an energy transition. Like, 
you know, like maybe lithium or some of the more pure battery metals are, but it, that energy transition just bolsters and provides further upside in the demand. I know it's held up fairly well. You've seen nickel prices and lithium and et cetera fall off, but copper is, is there. It's, it's strong. It hasn't, it's been relatively stable through this period. So yeah, we're positive. And then, yeah, as you mentioned, you know, on the, on the supply side, you know, what we see is just the, the importance of community acceptance when you're, when you're developing a new mine, that is, that is the key. And if you don't have that, as we've seen around the, wherever you are around the world in North America or elsewhere, you're going to have problems. So uh, the impacts of mining are, are very local, right? Like the benefits are, are global or the benefits are more regional, but the impacts are, are local and communities are, are focused on a big new operation coming into their neighborhood. And it's, you know, you've got to, you've got to do that the right way and have that acceptance to be successful. Yes, absolutely. I like to look at copper steward is copper is base load. Copper is base load. It doesn't matter what the application is. It has it. Yeah. So it's base load in my view. And over on this side of the desk, I suppose we also see things like uranium is very base load these days with respect to fuel for commercial reactors, the changing policy and thought about what is real high quality energy, which defines into many things, but high quality energy and copper is a factor in that. And it's a base load factor in my view. So appreciate the comments there on that. Well, why don't we stop on capital structure for a moment and then I want to come into projects and then get back to community towards the end here. But uh, on the capital structure, give us an update where we are on current cash on hand, uh, debt at the company, shares outstanding, and then also, if you don't mind, a little bit on the major shareholders, including management. Yeah, on our balance sheet right now, we've got roughly $100 million Canadian dollars of cash at year end. We've got about $60 million U.S. available on, on an undrawn uh, revolving credit facility. So in Canadian dollar terms, roughly 180 million of available liquidity as at year end. On the liability side, our key piece of debt is a 400 million US uh, high yield bond, which bears interest at 7% and matures in February, 2026. Yeah, and then we've got a little bit of equipment lease debt, but. You know, that's really normal course things that get paid off amortized quite quickly over the next two or three years that's the balance sheet on the we'll get into the florence funding a bit later but just maybe talk about where we are right now first um, so that's that's the balance sheet and then on the on the shareholder side uh roughly 290 million shares outstanding give or take market cap today of of approaching well we just had a good bump today but we're getting close to 500 million us market cap yeah, and, and, no, and I would say no major shareholders. Uh, we have one fund that's around 8%. They're probably our biggest. A couple of investors around 3 4%. Management as a group is around 3% as well. So when you include you know, myself and our other board members, we have reasonable positions in the company, well-invested, and obviously believe in what we're doing. So, But no, no kind of dominant share, major shareholder at this time. Let's come back to Gibraltar for a moment uh, and just discuss how you look at this project and this mine in the future. Really just talk about the importance of the foundation that this mine has really provided the company over the past years, as well as the potential that this mine has in the future to continue expanding, uh, adding to that mine life in the years ahead. You know, just talk about that and give the investors and the audience, if you will, a flavor of how cornerstone this is and the fact that it's going to be with us for a while and that there is still some good potential here. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's certainly a mine with a long history and, and a long life still ahead of it. Um, you know, we still have 22 years of reserves, right? Tosico has been operating this mine now for 20 years. Uh, we acquired it in, in the late 90s and restarted it in 2004. And, uh, you know, it, really at that time, um, it was when we restarted it, it was operating on original milling infrastructure from the 70s when the mine was built. So we embarked on a pretty significant capital investment program. Between about 2006 and 2013, we invested over 800 million Canadian dollars to modernize and upgrade uh, a mill, new mobile fleet. We actually added a second mill, a second circuit. So we have two independent milling circuits with total capacity now of 85,000 tons a day. That makes Gibraltar 
the fourth largest open pit copper mine in North America. Uh, so it's a sizable operation and it's been running at around that production rate or that milling rate since 2013. You know, that's what, 11 years now. So it's uh, it's been a very good an operation for us. You know, historically, you might have looked at the mine like this and said that it was, you know, if you go back to the 80s or 90s, it might have been viewed as a, a swing producer, a mine that you open and shut depending on copper prices. Well, it's not, you know, it's not that anymore, right? I mean, this is a mine that, that has a, with the, with the investments we've done and the improvements we've made, it's it's just going to operate now at any at any re, at any plausible uh, copper price and generate you know and generate good cash as we saw in the last year. Looking ahead, yeah, 22 years of, of reserves. Um, we don't. I mean, we always get the question, well, could you invest more and, and expand, you know, expand production? Um, yeah, I think the answer is. Um, yeah, we could. You know, we could expand some of our mills, get more, get more throughput. Um, but that hasn't been the focus. The focus of our, of Tseco has been to actually get a second mine running, rather than rather than do a major capital investment at Gibraltar. So we like it. We we like the way it's set up. Um, we want to keep it. Um, you know, we hope that it, actually it'll be a little bit boring <laughs> on the operational side, and just produce copper every year. And, and I think the excitement will come from you know. The leverage that we have to copper, right? As copper prices go up, we're going to make a lot more money from that mine. That's kind of the big picture of what Gibraltar is. It is a lower grade mine. I mean, it's 0.25% copper reserves, right? So that is on a global benchmarking basis, makes it a, a lower grade operation. But we make it work because it's also a very low cost operation. Getting ore through the mill at about 13 Canadian dollars a ton milled. You know, so we, we always remind investors, look, it's not just your grade per ton, it's your margin, it's your margin per ton. And there's two sides to that. There's costs and, <laughs> and revenues. And uh, our costs are very low. We're very, we believe we're very efficient operators. And, uh, you know, in fact, believe that, that that $13 a ton that I mentioned is makes makes Gibraltar uh, one of the lowest cost over pits in, in the Americas. So. You know, and how, how we achieve that, I think, is through uh, good operating practices, efficient and productive workforce. We have a very stable workforce. Everyone commutes from two nearby towns. We've got access to infrastructure. You know, we're right on the highway, right on the rail lines. We've got low-cost hydroelectric power right on the grid. A lot of advantages that, that make us, uh, that allow us to make it work and make money. So, yeah. I think it points to the fact that there's a number of other considerations and factors that really weigh into a good economic operation. And I think you've highlighted a number of those, Stuart, so I appreciate that. And then, you know, this project has been a great platform to lead into other things that you guys are doing, which we'll talk about here now. But uh, yeah, just a great highlight here of, of what you guys have been able to do with this and highlights the expertise and competency as well to operate these facilities and the people that have been involved over the years to get it to where it is today. So it's uh, it's been a good feat of an operation for sure. And I think sometimes folks tend to forget about that. And we've got a lot of life left in the footprint yet to go. So it's good stuff there. Why don't we skip into a construction update at Florence? We know this is essentially fully funded now. Permitting is behind us. Maybe just give us a little bit about how the schedule looks here and construction milestones yet to come. And then maybe if you don't mind, if you can speculate for us just a little bit here, Stuart, really the pro forma production profile at Tseco after this project is successfully brought online to commercial production. Sure. Pretty excited about what's happening at Florence. Obviously getting that final EPA permit last fall was a huge milestone for the company. You know, a lot of, a lot of copper mines have not been successfully permitted uh, in North America, so we were uh, we knew it was coming, and but glad to have that final validation. And, and uh, so, with that in hand, yeah, we transitioned tra now transitioned into the construction phase. Um, we've got contractors mobilizing. Uh, we're well advanced on site prep and kind of civil work um, for our initial facilities, our initial well field, and the plant. Um, so yeah, it's great. It's it's a great uh, 
time, you know, it's an exciting time for the company to really be shifting our, our mindset like that from a development phase into, into the construction, actual construction. The schedule as we go forward here, as I mentioned, we've, we've just started well field drilling about two or three weeks ago. The construction of the SXEW plant will start, will really get going in May or June, in a couple months here. Got to drill about 90 wells. So that drilling, we got four, we'll have four drill rigs running. That drilling should be completed in about Q3 of 2025. And then what we have to do is uh, inject our initial, um, we, we begin injection into our well field and we've got to do about three months of pre-leaching so that when we commission that SXEW plant in Q4 next year, um, we'll have pregnant leach solution ready to go. We'll have the plant running and we'll be able to start plating copper cathode right away. So first production is, is Q4 2025, very low operating cost um, operation. So we see this operation becoming cash flow positive quite quickly in the, in the first month or two. 2026 will be uh, a ramp up year. So we should produce probably around 50 million pounds of copper in our first full year of operations. And then we'll be in, by, in year two at around the production capacity, which is 85 million pounds. So it's a very meaningful, as you noted, it's a very meaningful growth in our production profile. Currently at Gibraltar, we're our, our attributable share there is around 100 to 110 million pounds. Adding 85 million pounds to that is, you know, it's 80% growth. And so um, it's very meaningful to be able to, you know, be in a position to achieve 80% production growth, you know, within the North American operation in the next, uh, the next two or three years here. So pretty exciting. I think lots of opportunity for shareholders. And uh, really, yeah, I think we're in a very unique spot. Yeah, Stuart, I think it's good to, to also, you know, highlight here that, and this will come into my next question, but just, you know, the cost profile of this project will bring down basically the company-wide profile. That's important to look at as well, and just the flexibility between the projects. And then also the fact that uh, going back to Gibraltar, that you guys have been able to actually manage the downside when the copper market has been a little bit weak, as we've seen in the past years. You guys have been able to successfully manage and weather those areas in the market as well. And I think that speaks importantly to how this has been structured. Plus now you have a cost profile at Florence that's actually very much complementary to existing operations. With that, the yeah. construction commissioning and operations expertise at Florence ISR, I wanna bring up here, because as you know, this business has been starved of competent people. Not a lot of people coming out of college that are focused in these areas of expertise. Talk about how Tosico is drawing upon its existing expertise and also is staffing up, bringing on competent people to operate at Florence, given there's very few companies out there that are operating both on the ISR front and also on the conventional front. So just talk about that. You know, there are principles of operating mines that translate uh, no matter what your mining method is. And I think that some of the practices we've developed at Gibraltar over the last 20 years and some of the people that obviously have been developed through that operation are key players here going forward at Florence, you know, in terms of executing and, and, and staffing and, and safety uh, performance, things like that. You know, these are, these are and, and cost discipline, cost management, and procurement, all these types of skills are, are transferable um, between operations and that's some of the expertise we're bringing certainly moving to an isr operation is something new for for Tosico. and we've we've been successful in uh in bringing in uh you know some experts that, that in fact our gm at the project um, is out of the uranium isr industry he's a lifelong uh, he's had a career of operating isr mines in uranium so you know, we, it's not new technology that we're we're doing there, but it's bringing uh, you know existing new existing technology to a new application. Pretty excited. I think believe we've got a very strong team in place. And of course, at Florence, I mean, remember we've actually operated this asset already, right? We built uh, in 2018. We built and operated a test well field, and uh, a lot of the key 
a lot of the key people that were involved in that are still still with us now and, and getting ready to ramp up the commercial scale facility. So we've got uh, we've got a good team, um, you know, in place, ready to do it, ready to do this, and we're pretty confident going forward here. The uh, yeah, and the economics as you touched on the cost structure. You know, Florence will produce copper at a dollar ten a pound. That's our based on our feasibility study. Uh, that is very low cost. That's first quartile, you know, globally, um, and it complements Gibraltar very well. Gibraltar will be produces a lot of pounds, but it'll be more like two twenty, two thirty a pound operating cost. So we're growing our top line, we're growing our pounds, but we're also lowering our costs, our consolidated costs at the same time. It's a good setup. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing this advance uh, and get into ramp up and so excited to see 2024 progress and also 2025 on that front. Want to talk about also Yellowhead Copper, uh, the work that's going on there as far as advancing that project as well. This one's a little bit further down the pipeline for the audience. This project is in British Columbia. Talk about the work ongoing there, upcoming milestones that you guys are working on. And if you can speculate again for us, maybe a little bit on the schedule. Yeah, Yellowhead is a is a major copper deposit um, back in back in British Columbia, uh, Central BC. It's a good good location just north of Kamloops. Um, yeah, it's uh, we we acquired the project in 2019. Um, did some re-engineering of the of the design, issued a new feasibility study in January 2020, and uh, it's a well you know it's that's a project that was quite advanced. By the, under the previous owners, um, and uh, you know it's, it's been around, but certainly with copper prices moving from up into the four dollar range, you know we believe this this type of project is going to be very attractive for us um, going forward. It's a bigger mine; um, it would produce in the first five years 200 million pounds of copper. Average life of mine production is about 180 million pounds. The NPV based on our feasibility study was 1.3 billion Canadian dollars. Now that was actually run only four years ago, but it was run at 310 copper prices. So you know that that needs to be that's an out of date copper number, right? Most most of these studies now are being done at 375 or four dollars. Um, you know, so so an operation like this, it's a big open pit, very similar to uh, the type of uh, mining that we're doing at Gibraltar is just higher grade. It's about a 0.32 copper equivalent uh, head grade versus 0.25 at Gibraltar. So um, again, we've got the skills to do it. We've got the expertise to, to run this type of mine. And we think it's something that fits an asset that fits very well as, as a potential third, uh, third operation or third leg for Tosico following on after Florence. So we've got some permitting work to do. Um, we're just getting set to go into an EA process. That could be three or four years of work, but um, you know I think that's I think that's fine. I actually think that fits quite well in our in the company's development. You know we can be we're focused in the short or in the next couple of years here on um, on building Florence, on ramping it up, and uh, when we when we get there, I think. Um, company with those two operations, Gibraltar and Florence, will be in a different a different category, a different league, I think, and we'll be, and if we have a project like Yellowhead that's all suddenly uh, shovel ready a few years down the road, it could be, you know, well positioned for further growth. So that's kind of how we're thinking about it. But I think in the, in the near term here, it's low capital investment required, it's permitting work, and uh, we can kind of move that forward quietly in the background. Yeah, that sounds great, Stuart. I like the approach there and how this potentially fits in. Assuming uh, overall schedule stays on and success on the permitting front, you see this as a project that really slots in somewhere around that 2030, 2031 timeframe. Is that roughly kind of how things look on the rough schedule? Yeah, if you think about three to four years of EA and permitting and two years of construction, that year out, it's kind of the 2030 timeframe. Yeah, copper production yeah. out. And- 2030 time frame. Yeah. yeah. Obviously the financing economics work out pretty well to look at, you know, how this thing gets built from a financing side. Of course, you'd have uh, 
backstopped by two other projects that are operating, two other mines that are operating uh, as well. You touched on that earlier is, is, you know, what does our company look like with Gibraltar and Florence, right? And, you know, if you're close to 200 million pounds of annualized copper production from those two operations and, you know, pro forma EBITDA in the range of 450 Canadian is what we, what we see at, at current copper prices. So yeah, we'll be a very different company in, in a couple of years. And really with ISR operations, you almost have to look at it as, you know, in this particular case, we're not really putting on our miner hat. We're actually putting on our plumbing hat. So we're not really miners in this case, we're plumbers. Yeah, it's That's more like an oil and gas operation, actually. It's, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's running a well field, right? I'm, uh, injecting solutions, pumping those solutions through a highly fractured ore body, recovering copper in solution, and then plating it through our SXEW plant on surface. So. You know, it's low cost mining, right? It's low cost, low impact. There's no surface disturbance here, right? You don't have to, dig, dig, you're not digging a, a pit. There's no tailings pond, there's no waste rock. So all these ESG metrics in terms of our carbon intensity or water consumption or energy use, we're first quartile on, on all of those in, in addition to the cost profile being very low. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's definitely a, an attractive project in that respect. Agreed. Any comments on the Alley Niobium project? Yeah, Niobium for us is uh, a little bit outside of our core focus on copper, but we we were interested in the in the Alley project just just because it, it it's an open pitable deposit in BC, and it, I think it fit fit our operating believe that it fit our operating skill set. You know, to break into the niobium market is uh, it's it's a bit of a niche a niche metal. The market is dominated by one major uh, supplier, one major mine in Brazil that, that produces about 80 to 85 percent of the world's niobium. So for us to break into that market and actually develop a niobium mine is the key. There, I think, is finding an offtake uh, solution and potentially a partner to help us develop that. Um, niobium is a pretty interesting commodity. It uh, goes into uh, high strength, lightweighting uh, steels, high strength, low alloy steels. So it's, yeah, you add a, a sprinkle of niobium and, and it actually reduces, makes steel lighter and stronger. Used in, in these kind of specialty metals in aerospace and military applications. So it's always at the top of the critical mineral rankings. It's something that, that has strategic value for us so you know but i but i would say it's it's something we work on the marketing side and we're doing some metallurgical test work but it's not a project that we're going to be investing huge amounts of money in in the next couple of years because we really want to be focused on um, getting florence going i think that highlights just the the pipeline and we're not even done with the pipeline yet but it it highlights yeah. the continuing pipeline and how this even slots in, depending, again, it could be an M&A transaction for that, uh, could be some type of partnership, could be some type of project that gets advanced after you guys start to clear the existing plate of projects, which obviously there's there's yeah. at least you know three on that plate at the moment. So I think that's just to highlight the optionality there and also the potential hidden value and really the carry cost plus research and development cost there is uh, negligible as you guys continue to do some work there and engage in discussions with that. Yeah. We, of course, we have to talk about new prosperity. Any updates there? I know that there's ongoing discussions with this project, but uh, anything that you can give us as far as updates with respect to advancement there, partnership with local community to hopefully one day put this project as well in the pipeline and into development. I guess the update that we just gave on our with our earnings release um, this week was just the fact that we've um, extended the standstill agreement for a final term here. So that's just something we've signed off in the last few weeks. And, uh, you know, the dialogue is uh, with the Chilcotin Nation and the province of BC is, is ongoing. It's been a constructive dialogue, I think meaningful progress in recent months, but, but it's not complete. And uh, we've got more work to do, uh, you know, but certainly it's, it's a constructive discussion and we're hopeful we'll be able to finalize um, a resolution this year, um, you know, that new, new prosperity deposit is a, is a fantastic opportunity for, for the province, for the community. It's a major copper gold 
uh, for free that's that's right there uh, near surface for, for development. It's one of the largest undeveloped copper gold porphyries in the world, uh, but it's had that community uh, issue and that community opposition and, and, a, and a troubled, I guess you could say, a troubled history in some respects. So we're very much focused on on resolving that conflict and, and really trying to unlock some value there. You know, that's our job as, as management is to realize value from our projects and that, that's what we're working on. I think from a shareholder perspective right now, it's not an asset that gets much attention. I don't think there's any value in our in our stock for it today, but uh, you can you can think about it as a free option. <laughs> you know, anything that happens here is kind of free, uh, a free upside that's not reflected in our equity value at all. Um, and when you have that, you know, essentially a seven seven or eight million ounces of gold in reserve there, and, and you know billions of pounds of copper, it's yeah, there's there's value there. So we'll see what happens. It's not too much more I can say about the dialogue. Obviously, it's confidential, but uh, we're working through it. You know, it takes time to deal with these things and advance these. This is a super asset by any measure for any major or mid tier company. It's a very large asset in a jurisdiction that quite frankly is well proven and demonstrated with respect to copper and gold production in British Columbia. I wish you guys good luck there as you guys continue to progress that. And it's a, it, this is a big needle mover for the company and it's a needle mover really for any company. So appreciate your comments on that. I guess while we're on community front, just a little bit here, Talk about maybe some of the important initiatives that Tosico is doing to utilize local service providers, you know, in the case of BC and also Arizona, US, create jobs, and really also just add in the education and skills development in the community. And of course, that education on the importance of responsible mining and energy development, as well as anything else you'd like to say just on the front and what Tosico is doing in the community front, which I know you guys are doing quite a bit of things in different locations big part of our business, big focus, you know, at, at the operations for sure. I mean, Gibraltar is is the largest employer um, in the Caribou region that we operate in, in central BC. Um, we're a key, I believe we're a key part of that community. We have 750 jobs, we have 750 people working at the mine. Uh, and that definitely, you know, brings a bring some responsibility with it to be to be good operators and to take care of our care of the environment and take care of our our employees. You know, we're proud of that. I think we're, yeah, as I said, a major economic contributor, but also uh, we think we do good work. Um, the mine has won the John Ash Safety Award uh, many times over the last five or ten years, which is that, that is the, that award is given by the province of BC to the safest large open pit mine in, in the province. Our safety standards are very high. And environmentally too, we're, we're award-winning. We spend a lot of work on on ongoing reclamation and in terms of managing our our tailings uh, storage and our water discharge. We believe we do that to a very high standard. And similarly in Florence, Florence is also a mining. Well, Florence is actually a mining center in the center of a very historical mining district there between Phoenix and Tucson. There's a belt of copper mines and smelters. Lots of existing expertise in that area. Lots of people working at more more traditional mines in the area that are looking at our project and going, wow, that's that's pretty interesting. I want to be involved in that. Lots of good resumes on the hiring side and lots of excitement for the future. Lots of excitement in the community. I think on Florence, the big thing that breakthrough I think we had in terms of the community acceptance there was was operating that test facility that I talked about. We built that in 2018, operated it for 18 months. And had a had an open door policy through that period where people from the surrounding areas could kind of come through and, and see what we were really doing, see the low impact mining method, um, and and just yeah just be transparent in how we operate and and through that process I think we gained a lot of community support and uh, by the time it came to our permitting process, our public comment period with the EPA, I think we had. You know, 98% or 99% positive commentary um, through that through that process. So, kind of speaks to the way that we've we've developed our our business down there. And uh, yeah, it's uh, as you said, it's a it's a critical part of 
critical part of mining is, is getting the communities involved and feeling like the communities benefit from, from what we're doing. That's how we think about it. And then, of course, moving to the new project, Yellowhead, we, you know, we bring the same approach. We want to be involved. We want to engage, find out what the hot button issues are in the, in the community and figure out how we can be a part of improving things. An ongoing discussion there, for sure. Well, the outcome with the public comment period on floor, it's, that metric is a pretty impressive number. Not common, I suppose, on that front, Stuart. And then, you know, I think the other thing, too, is, is as you look at the pipeline, you now have are building a demonstration set of projects for the upcoming projects for people to look at and, and take model of and see that, hey, you know, this is what we've been doing. And, and we've been not only have we been saying this, but we've actually been demonstrating and proving this through our existing operations. And I think that's also a very interesting asset that you guys have to leverage upon that other companies, maybe single asset companies can't do or can't prove. And so, right. yeah, I really appreciate the comments on that. That's exactly right. The fact that, you know, we bought, I mean, we acquired Florence in 2014. We've been at it there with a team in place, you know, a project site, permitting efforts and test work, you know, for 10 years, right? And a junior company, I don't think could have could have sustained that through the capital markets over that period of time. And in fact, we've had Gibraltar running and, and as kind of a cash flow engine has allowed us to do that. So Gibraltar is a big part of what we've been able to achieve at Florence. Well, Stuart, let's leave it there for now. I appreciate you uh, taking the extra time with us today. Why don't we leave it there and, and hopefully pick up the conversation in the future here this year. But uh, just leave you with this question for potential investors who are listening in. The company has a market capitalization of about 475 million US dollars. Why should Tseco yeah. Mines be considered within the institutional family office and retail investors portfolio at this stage? Yeah, I think it's really the uplift that we're, we expect to see in our share price as we develop Florence and bring it online and wrap it up. We don't believe we get much value in our equity for the Florence development. If you look at the EBITDA generation that the company's going to have pro forma with Florence, I mentioned it's something in the range of 450 million EBITDA pro forma at current copper prices. I think any reasonable multiple on that on that level of earnings, you know, we should be a five or a six dollar stock, not a not a two dollar stock. So that's really the opportunity for shareholders, and we're going to unlock that over the next couple of years here. So I would add two things to that. One is, I believe copper prices are going up, and we have a lot of leverage to that proving copper market. And as we've touched on here on the call, you've got between Yellowhead, New Prosperity, and Alley. More, a lot more optionality and value in the portfolio that we think is going to be unlocked. So, Well said. I think there's a lot of viable things that you said there, and I think folks should be paying attention to it if they have want to have some exposure to the copper market amongst some other optionality items we have here, plus the backstopping of cash flow, existing operations, which we're not taking speculation risk on a small explore co in some other jurisdiction. We actually have a level of safety here and a, a lower level of risk. And so I think that's important for a good class of investors. And I think really, as you structure a mining and energy portfolio, that this cash flow is obviously very important. And you guys have certainly demonstrated that. What is the best way, Stuart, for folks to reach out to the company? We've got certainly our, our phone number and our uh, IR department contact details on our website there. So feel free to reach out to uh, Brian Brigo, our VPIR, or, or myself here in our Vancouver office, we're available. Stuart, great to have you back on the program to update and talk about the work going on at Tosico. Keep up the efforts and looking forward to having you back, hopefully later this year. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks for having me, Andrew.